Yo, welcome back to another episode of On The Spot Sports. I'm Jack, and in today's episode, we are here with a very special guest, Ryan Fitzgerald, who plays in the Boston Red Sox organization for the Salem Red Sox. Ryan, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. It's good, good to get you on. So, uh, since we've been in this weird, weird time right now for uh, quarantine due to COVID-19, and your season's uh, pushed back, obviously, what have, what have you been doing during quarantine trying to stay in shape for baseball season to officially start, hopefully? Yeah, no, I, um, I'm actually – I'm in my, uh, my little home gym downstairs in my basement right now. Um, I got a few, uh, few weights down here that I've been working out with. But uh, fortunately enough for me, I've had a, a couple facilities in the area that, that um, have opened um, just to some of the pros in the area, which is nice. So uh, I've been able to get my training in. Um, some of the other, some of the other pros in the area have been training with me. So, uh, we've kind of put together our own little small spring training, uh, I guess, in a sense. Um, so we'll, you know, I'll be ready if, uh, if there is a season. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely a interesting time, but at least you get to train with, uh, the, the pros in the area and just like stay in shape if, definitely. if there is a season to come. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to bring you back to like when you were younger and like get a background, background information on like, when did you start playing baseball? Why? And like the different teams you've been on leading up to playing uh college ball in, at Creighton. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, I actually grew up in Detroit, Michigan, um, played hockey there for, well, I grew I played hockey for 15 years from when I was like three till I was 18 to the end of high school. Um, and, um, I kind of pretty much played baseball and hockey my entire life, uh, probably since I was, you know, three or four years old. Um, it kind of introduced me through my dad. My dad was always a big baseball fan, and he had played a little bit, uh, a little bit of baseball. No, no professional, but um, he was the one that kind of get me, got me into the game. Um, and then when I moved back from uh, from Michigan to Chicago, where I currently live, uh, that was kind of when I decided to pursue baseball a little more than hockey. Um, had I stayed in Michigan, I probably would have pursued hockey over baseball, but, um, just kind of like with the, uh, uh, the culture here in Chicago, it wasn't too big on hockey. So, um, you know, I had the opportunity to leave my, leave my family and go bill it with a family up in, up in Michigan and try to pursue that route. But, uh, I didn't want to leave my family. So, uh, I came here, I played, um, for the, uh, Illinois Sparks, uh, travel baseball team. Um, we trained at a facility in, a uh, suburb of Chicago that was owned by Bo Jackson. Um, I still train there to this day. Um, super nice facility. Um, and then from there, I went on to play at Creighton. Um, played for a lot of summer ball teams um, during the summers of my college. So played um, in the, uh, the uh, Northwoods League uh, for the Kenosha Kingfish for a little bit. Uh, Hamptons League up in uh, Long Island, New York. And then... Um, I played in the Prospect League as well in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, so what was that like in the Northwoods League before uh, Creighton? Yeah, so, well, that, it was actually after my sophomore year I played in the Northwoods League. It was the summer in between my sophomore and junior year. Um, honestly, I didn't like it. <laughs> we, um, I don't know, I think it was more of the situation I was in. I was on a, on a new team. They had just, uh, it was their first season in, in the Northwoods. Um, I, I wasn't really too fond of the coaching, but, uh, yeah, I was a shortstop and we had signed, I guess there was like three shortstops on the team. So I was playing like every third day. So I really wasn't getting much playing time. And, uh, that was, I actually ended up leaving after about a month and I went, went to the Hamptons league and I finished the summer out there, um, playing short every day and kind of get my reps in. So, um, but yeah, summer ball, summer ball was good for me. It was good to experience a lot of, met a lot of good people. Um, I still keep in contact with them today, but, um, yeah, summer ball is really kind of the, uh, um, introduction, I guess you could say to professional baseball where, um, it's really kind of on you to get better. Yeah. I've definitely heard, heard some, uh, some interesting things about the Northwoods league and like it, I've heard good things and I've also heard bad things. So it's good to get mm-hmm. perspective from, from you since you definitely, actually yeah. that level. Yeah, so from 2013 to 2016, you played uh, college ball with uh, Crane University in the Big East Conference. So going back to like, your your freshman year, what made you decide to commit to uh, Crane? And then how did, how did you think your first year playing in uh, college went? Yeah, so I uh, I committed to Creighton at the – I want to say it was like the end of my sophomore year. They had I had gone out to a camp out there um, – 
you know, the colleges, they always send out letters to players and, you know, so, some kids think they're personalized, but it was one of those like mass, like, Hey, you know, come to our camp. So I was like, all right, whatever, I'll try it. So I'd never heard of crate before. So I drove out to Omaha with my mom, um, went to the, you know, three day camp. And at the end of the camp, they, um, they offered me a scholarship at the end of the camp. And, uh, I, I, uh, it was the first college that offered me anything. And, um, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what to do at that time. Cause I hadn't, I felt like I hadn't, uh, explored my options enough yet. So I didn't commit right there on the spot, but, uh, I, uh, ended up coming back for another visit, um, talked to the coaches. They kind of showed me around and, um, I ended up committing then uh, a couple of weeks later, but, uh, yeah, my first year at Creighton, um, I was, I always tell them a story, um, especially when I'm talking to some younger guys who, who aren't as big and feel like that they can't play at that level. Um, I was like five, 10, 148 pounds my freshman year. And, uh, I was, I was the starting DH for the team. Um, I didn't start initially. I sat on the bench for the first like two weeks maybe. And, um, after that, I kind of started to find my way into the lineup and, um, they had a lot of upperclassmen that were playing the infield. So I kind of had to wait my turn, but, um, they kept putting me in the DH spot. So, I was a 148 pound starting DH for a, a Division One school my freshman year. <laughs> did you did you get a lot of shit for that or? No, not really. Um, you know, it was always there was a little pressure to like, oh, put on weight, put on weight. But um, I knew I could play, so like for me, I if I performed on the field, I, I didn't care if I weighed 120 pounds or 200 pounds, as long as I performed, that was all that mattered. Yeah. So. Uh... So then you went into your second year, uh, and you uh, be- you became the starting shortstop, and you started in all 50 games, I believe it was, and you averaged a 240 batting average. Do you think you finally got got used to like uh, that transition period from high school ball slash travel ball to like college level at that time? Yeah, no, I I think I made the transition pretty well in, in my um, my freshman year. Like I said, there were guys in front of me that uh, you know I said to wait my turn, and um, you know I had I had even thought about possibly transferring at that time too um, to another school, but um, yeah, I stuck it out. I made some really good friends there, um, and yeah, I mean my sophomore year was definitely one of my favorite years. It was one of the best teams that I was on there. Um, we led the nation in in fielding percentage. I think we had like a nine eighty five fielding percentage I think for the entire team so I was number one in the NCAA and I was a starting shortstop for every game so that was really cool to be a part of that but uh, yeah I played with some absolutely incredible players there as well yeah so going back to like your freshman year really quick uh, what was your mindset through like when you're trying to like when you're thinking about transferring but then didn't yeah uh there's a lot of conversations with my parents um you know I think a lot of a lot of coaches would tell players that you know they shouldn't transfer. They should stick it out. Just work hard. And um, I don't necessarily agree with that because there's a lot of players that do work hard and, you know, they think they're going to get a shot and before they know it, it's their senior year and they still haven't really gotten um, solid playing time. Um, especially if you want to go play professional baseball, you got to play. So, um, you know, I always tell kids go to a place where you're going to play. Don't go to a place that, you know, it's, it's cool to tell people you're going to. And then, you know, a year or two in, you haven't even played yet. I don't, that's, that's not very cool. So, um, yeah, for me, it was, it was really kind of more of like a, uh, what are, what are my chances of being a starting player? Um, you know, my sophomore year and, um, how, how will it shake out in terms of me, um, wanting to fulfill my dream of being professional. So, uh, we came to the conclusion that, uh, I had the best shot to, um, to start there at Creighton, you know, my sophomore year and, and contribute to the team. And, uh, that's what, what ended up happening. So uh, it all worked out. Yeah, you did that exact thing and uh, started all 50 games that, that season. So what was the biggest difference you saw from, like, your freshman year to your sophomore year? Yeah, let's see, that's that's a good question. Um, I, the game got easier for me um, between my freshman year and my sophomore year. My freshman year, um, I was really, like, sped up and um, I don't want to say, like, nervous, but um, you just kind of, like, wonder, can I, can I compete at this level? Can I play at this level? And after I got that first year under my belt, um, you know, and I, I was the starting shortstop, it was more of a, uh, you know, my confidence was was at an all time high. So I I knew I could play at that level, and um, I was looking to get to the next level. Then you know, I was always getting to the next level. So um, for me, the game slowed down a little bit um, as the years went on. 
Yeah, so that obviously definitely helped you, I I would uh, think. So I read uh, that, like, you start out your sophomore year, like, not not the best. So, like, what was your mindset during that time, and what? how do you think you were able to, like, come out of that and, like, be more consistent as the season went on? Yeah, no, I think I got really unlucky um, a lot of the time in my sophomore year. I, I hit a lot of good baseballs, I remember, and I would uh, – you know, I'd crush three balls in a game and I'd be, you know, 0 for 3 or like 1 for 4. And I'd be like, man, I hit, you know, three or four good baseballs, but uh, they just didn't land for hits. So um, for me, I knew that that it wasn't necessarily the result that I was after. It was, um, you know, the process. And my process was good. Um, and that's one thing that's, that's gotten better, you know, with each day nowadays um, is my process. And I'm not really too concerned with the results and the numbers um, just as long as that I stick to my plan and my process. And if, if I don't stray from that, um, that's, that's success for me. And um, I, I have full trust that the numbers will be there if I do stick to that process. Yeah. So would you say that the process is like one of like the most important things you've learned and just uh, stick throughout, stick through the process no matter what? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say too, that it's not necessarily just, you know, the process in general, because especially in college baseball, I feel like coaches kind of um, foist the process upon you and they don't really give you the option to build your own process. They kind of say, this is the process, you know, my way or the highway. Um, so that was something I kind of learned throughout college and even more so after college, kind of when I got, when I got into independent baseball, um, figuring out my own process and how I was going to be a better player um, and understand my body better and what I need to do to be successful because nobody knows myself better than me. So creating that process around the idea of that was um, was huge for me. Yeah, that's uh, definitely some great stuff that you just said. So you said that your your team, uh, your sophomore year, is one of the best teams you've played on. How What was it like playing for, like, a really good team that, like, you had a lot of potential? Yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, we, it was, it was kind of like there was, there wasn't much pressure because you knew that as soon as the ground ball was hit, it was going to be fielded. Um, no matter what, like we, you know, we just didn't make errors. Uh, you know, any ball that was up in the air, it was going to get caught. Um, and then even, even at the plate, it's, uh, the pressure was a lot less knowing that the guy behind you was going to get the job done if you didn't. So, um, it wasn't just kind of like, man, I'm the only guy that's going to be able to get this job done. I have to do it. Uh, you know, we had guys one through nine that were able to contribute, which was really cool. Yeah, that, that's a, that's huge for the team, especially when you get that, like, like that, like, situation. It's really huge for that to happen. So your, your junior year was a big year for you as you batted 270. You had a team high with four home runs, led the team with 13 doubles and 80 total bases. What do you think the biggest – what do you think was the biggest thing that made you guys so successful that season? What did you learn from, like, the previous two years to help you succeed and help lead the younger guys? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it goes back, again, more to me figuring out myself as a player. Um, I kind of started taking ownership in my own game and, and what I wanted to do. Um, and I had been told, you know, for many years that I was a, a slap hitter, a contact hitter. And uh, I knew I knew I had more in the tank. I knew I had more power. And um, it was being, um, you know, I had a ceiling. People were putting ceilings on me, and I I believed it. And when I got to my junior year, I kind of told myself, "Look, I'm going to try to hit home runs. I'm going to try to hit hit for power. I'm going to try to hit doubles." Um, and that's what I did. And you can see, obviously, that the uh, um, statistics show that. Um, so again, owning my own process and believing in um, something that I, you know, I had conviction about because I really didn't have conviction on on being a slap hitter, being a contact guy. Um, I wanted to be the guy that was hitting balls over people's heads. You know, that's just, I have more fun doing that. It's a game. And um, I, I, I believed in that um, as a player. And that was kind of the mindset I took into that year. Hey, Ryan, it's Tyler from On The Spot Sports here uh, joining us. Um, you mentioned you're talking about your process. Um, how confident are you that this process is going to make you the best baseball player in your mind that you could be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So back in the day when I was in college, I did not know very much about myself or my body or um, kind of like what I was capable of. Nowadays, with the technology that I've been able to apply to 
my swing and my body and, and even my intent that I'm trying to trying to do when I'm in the box. Um, I know exactly, you know, objectively what I am capable of. And I'm able to compare those numbers to what big leaguers are doing. Um, you know, I have, I have numbers on the big league guys. So um, me knowing what I'm trying to chase in terms of the process of, of creating a better bat speed, a better uh, bat path, um, you know, getting, getting more into the ground, creating more ground force. Um, those are all objective numbers that um, I can, I can train towards. Um, so my process nowadays is, is pretty, um, I want to call it factual. It isn't, it isn't just the coach saying, Hey, do this, do that, try this, try that. Um, the guesswork is taken out of it completely. And I train very objectively now. So um, my process is, is extremely objective um, and science-based. Yeah. So would you say creating that like system, like, I guess you'd call it, is like super important for like, for like your development as like a professional going from college into the, the professional levels? Yeah, definitely. It, it, um, it's the reason why I'm still playing it, uh, in a way kind of revived my career, you know, after I didn't get drafted out of college, I was a free agent signed and, um, started learning and getting into this stuff. Um, it definitely saved my career, um, and has put me in the place that, that I'm in now. Um, you know, and I feel every, each year I feel better and better at the plate, more comfortable, uh, more experienced. And I'm sorry, you know, the more pitches you see, the more movement solutions that your brain has for your body. Um, so it's just only a matter of time for me, um, as long as I stay on this path to keep going and, um, you know, reach my, my full potential. Yeah. So you were saying about, um, like what's your mindset like going in the box like you're in the box like what do you think about like are you like paying attention to like anything specific or like what's what's uh happening when you're in the in the box mm -hmm. yeah so once i get in the box in the box there really isn't much there's a lot leading up to it though you know there's a lot of scouting reports that we go over you know and, and the numbers and and stuff we have on pitchers and the numbers that the pitchers have on us as hitters is absolutely incredible i mean we know everything about them and they know everything about us um, so kind of, we find, kind of formulate that game plan before we get into the box um, and have an understanding of what we want to do. So, but, but once we get in the box, um, for me at least, um, I, have, I have an intent to do damage every time. Um, I'm not looking to you know, slap a ball the other way or just make contact. Um, I'm looking to drive the baseball at all times in all counts. Um, you, know, you only get three strikes, and I want to use all three of them. I don't want to waste them. Um, I want to try to hit at the top of the count. I'm not looking to miss any fastballs that, that he leaves over the middle of the plate. Um, and then anything he leaves up, I'm also looking to crush as well. Um, but for me, I know my strength is pull side and I know they shift me and, and that's fine. That's fine with me. I'm not, I'm not going to complain about that, but uh, for me, I know my strengths are pull side. Um, so I'm looking to put a ball in the air, pull side pretty much every time. Yeah. That's uh, that's a big thing when you get in the box is just like not to like think overthink. Uh, and just like focus on like being like I'm able to hit the ball I'm able to I have so much power just use it so it's really good to get like that perspective on it as well mm -hmm. yeah so uh, your junior year you also earned a second team second team all big east honor at second base and you're voted on to the tournament team so what was it like being honored with that honor and like being selected as someone to be on the all tournament team yeah, it was cool uh, for sure. To uh, I you know I'd never really been recognized before um, for for you know things I'd done on the field before, but uh, yeah, it was cool and it was just kind of you know another stepping stone um, towards the ultimate goal of playing professional baseball. So uh, yeah, I mean looking back on it, it was a good experience and uh, you know I'm thankful I had it. Yeah. So uh, during your uh, senior season, how do you think the program had become since like you started as a freshman to your senior year? Yeah, uh, going through it for four years was hard. Um, Creighton is definitely a very tough school, um, baseball-wise, to go through. It's um, it's a lot of uh, hard work. I don't want to necessarily necessarily say smart work. Um, there were a lot of things we did that I I kind of look back on and think that they really weren't serving me. But um, I I would say I was over coachable uh, in college. You know, I no, I didn't know myself well enough to um, to say no, but uh, yeah, when I got to my senior year, I kind of looked back on it. and um, The amount of uh, work we would do before games was, like, I think way too much. I used to count my throws before games, and, um, 
know, we would take infield and we'd warm up and everything. And I would, I would make 130 throws before every game. Like I would count them like, cause my arm would be hanging. I'm popping ibuprofen like it's candy, which I don't recommend. But uh, yeah, looking back on that, you know, senior year, um, it was tough just cause I knew my body was, was at, getting absolutely hammered. Um, and I've learned a lot, you know, in the, in the past few years with nutrition and um, how to recover better. Um, all things I wish I knew back then that I think really would have helped me. Yeah. So you said your body was taking a toll, like after like your, your season ended, did you think about going pro? Did you like, I know you were undrafted. Like, did you think about like trying to like pursue that pro career? Like what, what happened after that? Yeah, no, I knew I wanted to play. Um, most of the guys that were in my grade were fifth year seniors. So they were all a year older than me. Um, some of them even two years older than me. They just happened to be one class older than me. But, uh, yeah, I knew I wanted to play. Um, I had gotten a call from the San Francisco Giants. I remember on, like, day three of the draft. And, you know, they said, hey, we might we might sign you. Um, but, you know, like, no, don't have any expectations. You know, we may, we may pick you up in a late round. We might get you a free agent contract or whatever. I was like, yeah, dude, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll sign for anything. I just want to play. And uh, that obviously didn't end up happening. So uh, I started going and trying out for independent baseball teams. And um, I got turned down from, from all of them, actually. And uh, my mom was at a showcase for my little brother. My little brother was playing baseball at this time back in, uh, back in high school. And she ended up talking to a Division three baseball scout who had a connection with um, the Gary South Shore Railcats um, independent baseball team. And so my mom said, yeah, you know, I know this, you know, I know the coach over there. Let me give him a call. I think they need an infielder. And um, that happened. And I got a call from the manager uh, a few days later and um, they ended up, they ended up finishing their season and I didn't hear from them till like November. Um, so it was a couple months in between that phone call. Um, and then when, when I finally got a call from their manager in November, they offered me a contract and uh, the rest is history. You know, I played for them for a year and then uh, the Red Sox picked me up. So what was your thought process like from not getting the opportunity you thought you would after the Giants and then you go to the next team? What was your like thought process like? You, you, obviously, you were a little bit down, but then it got up. So what was that kind of like steep hill thought process climb for you? Yeah, the thought process for me was I got nothing to lose. Um, you know, I literally – there's no expectations of me. Um, and there's literally – there's nothing for – you know, if I fail, I fail. Um, but if I succeed, I got everything to gain. So um, that was kind of my thought process. Every time I stepped on the field and any ball was, um, again, trying, trying to do damage with every swing. I was like, I'm going to have fun with this. The most fun thing you can do in baseball is hit a home run. So I'm going to try to hit as many home runs as I can. Um, you know, as a 22-year-old in a, in a league that was, I think the average age in the league was 28, um, I was facing some really advanced pitchers that had just come out of double-A, triple-A, um, my, fir my first hit was off of, um, an ex big league pitcher who was in, um, the system with the Rangers and I believe the Phillies, you know, he's in a starting rotation. He, he pitched out of bullpens in the big leagues. And, um, I, we faced him our first game of the season. I ended up going one for four that game and got my first hit off to him. Um, so that was cool. But, uh, yeah, my mindset was really just like, I got nothing to lose. I'm gonna have as much fun as I can and let's see where this takes me. Yeah. So what was it, the feeling like getting that first hit, especially off, uh, of an ex uh, big leaguer it was cool it was kind of uh i mean really just the i don't know if you guys have heard of the saint paul saints but they're uh independent ball and saint or independent ball team in in uh saint paul minnesota and they uh they draw like i think on average like fifteen thousand fans a game or like ten thousand fans something like that so it was opening day and they had like seventeen thousand fans in there and um it was my first professional game i was starting at shortstop and uh it was crazy it was so loud and um the whole atmosphere was like incredible. You know, I didn't expect that in independent baseball, but uh, it was cool, you know, to get my first hit. Obviously nobody was cheering for me because we were at their place. We weren't at home, but uh, I got that ball and uh, I, I gave it to my dad. So that was a cool moment as well. But yeah, it's uh, it was a good feeling to get that first hit for sure. Yeah. You got your teammates and your family cheering for you. That's all that really matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how do you think that season went overall for you? Like your first like pro season like I know there's ups and downs of being a professional athlete especially your first year it's like how was like all that yeah I think it went really well um you know considering I came out of the big east which really wasn't a, uh, a big baseball conference still isn't it's more of a basketball conference but 
um, adjusting from from a uh, style of play at Creighton where it was really just defense was all that mattered and whatever you did at the plate was whatever they didn't really care it was more of just let's try to win this game one nothing and play defense to um, going to independent baseball where you got to hit so um, I think I held my own in terms of my age and my experience um, and you know there's a big learning curve that I think I um, I adapted to pretty quickly um, which is really good for me and I, I think it's it's definitely pole vaulted me um, into the position I am I'm in now um, going through that experience and seeing those types of pitchers um, you know I'll, I'll probably be seeing similar type pitching this year in um, in double a yeah so what was that like it, what, what was the biggest thing you learned from like going from like your your uh, college ball season to like being a pro like that like whole like learning experience there yeah um a lot of veterans on my team and I, and um I learned a lot from them um watching the way that they go about their business is like it was incredible um but that was that was really when I kind of started to watch um how they worked um they were very smart about what they did. Um, I was still kind of stuck in the mode of uh, any work is good work. So, you know, I was the guy that was taking a million swings on the field and always wanting to get extra ground balls and stuff, um, you know, which, which is good to an extent, but you get to a point of diminishing returns. And that's, you know, that's kind of what I was explaining to where I had gotten to in college where, you know, I, I was just doing, I was just doing work to do work and I had gotten to a point of diminishing returns where my body was taking a hit. Um, so watching these, these veterans that have been playing baseball for, you know, 13, 14, some of them 15 years who, who are playing to support their families, you know, they got, they're 30 years old with, uh, you know, a couple kids and a mortgage that they're trying to pay off. So, uh, watching these guys go about their business, um, in a smart way was really what I, I learned most from them. Um, when I, when I switched from college to professional. Yeah, so you were talking about recovery and, like, nutrition earlier, and you just said uh, recovery and, like, how your body was taking a toll. It's so, like, what would you do for, like, recovery-wise, and, like, how important it was uh, nutrition for you, especially when you got into, like, the, the professional game? Yeah, so um, for me, the biggest thing that I've, like, made sure is to get enough protein, but not just protein for this, you know, sake of protein – um, like in college, we would get these, um, these Gatorade supplements that had, you know, some Gatorade protein shake, right? I loved them. They tasted phenomenal, but, um, it had 27 grams of sugar and there was two servings in each shake. So it's like, holy cow, like I'm getting, is that 54 grams of sugar? Yeah. Like that's just not good. So, um, getting the right kind of protein has really been a big thing for me as well as, um, balancing that out with, um, more colorful foods. Um, I try to eat vegetables as much as I can, as well as take a, uh, a uh, fruit and green supplement with that. So um, for me, that's been huge in my recovery, making sure I get replenished the vitamins um, that I really wasn't replenishing when I was in college. Um, and even, even really getting strict on like, like the meat, you know, like meat isn't just meat. Um, I, I make sure that the, that all the, um, the, the beef and steak that I eat is all grass fed. Um, and the chicken is, you know, free range chicken. It's not, you know, antibiotic free, um, all stuff like that, you know, organic, non GMO. Um, I think that's been huge for me in terms of that. Cause that's, that stuff really can wear you down the more you eat the, the, uh, you know, fake, uh, fake meat as I like to call it. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point because like, especially like when you're younger, you don't like usually like focus on like your nutrition. Like I know I didn't. And since I'm uh, I'm a college athlete right now, like that's a big thing, especially especially like running and like playing baseball and all that, and hockey as well. Using nutrition's of a huge thing, and so is recovery. So that's it's uh, all very important. It comes like it comes all in a circle. For sure. Yeah. So uh, the next season, you uh, got signed by the Boston Red Sox, and uh, you went in to play the season with the Greenville Drive in the South. Atlantic League so what was your time in Green Greenville like and uh the experience has sparked on your way into the Boston Red Sox organization yeah it was uh it was really cool I um when I got signed I went down to extended spring training to train there for a month um because I actually independent ball starts in um in May so I hadn't had a spring training yet um because that was when I had gotten signed early May it was like May 3rd or something or I think the official date said May 5th, which was yesterday. Um, 
and I, I tweet about it every every year just as kind of like a memory. But uh, I end, I think I ended up coming going down there like May third or something. But uh, yeah, I was down there, and uh, Dustin Pedroia happened to be rehabbing at that time as well. So I got to play in a couple of uh, extended spring training games with him and uh, talk to him a little bit, and I actually relaced his glove for him and. He paid me two hundred dollars to do it, which was which was a cool experience for sure. But uh, yeah, I ended up going to the Greenville Drive after that. And um, when I got there, it was just before the uh, the All Star break, and I think there were like twenty seven games back at that point. So I I kind of was like, man, like <laughs> it's gonna be a rough one. And uh, so then then the um, the uh, standings reset at the All Star break in the minor leagues. So everyone was back to back to zero, and uh, we kind of had a fresh start. Uh, which was cool. And we were, we were in first place all the way up until the last series. And uh, we were in a, like a three-way tie, I think at the end of the year, and we had to win three games in a row. We we ended up losing one of them. So we ended up not making playoffs, but um, yeah, we kind of went from, uh, I don't want to say we, but they were, they were in, you know, dead last the first half. And then the second half, we, uh, we ended up taking second place. So it was, um, it was a good experience for sure. Yeah, so how cool was it uh, playing with uh, Dustin Pedroia for a little bit there and, uh, like, him paying you $200 to lace up his glove? Yeah, it was uh, it was quite the experience for sure. The um, After my medical papers were cleared, they uh, they told me, they're like, hey, uh, go, you're going to go out to the big field and uh, you're going to hit there today. I was like, okay, cool. So, I, you know, I grab my stuff and walk out there and um, I see Pedroia out there. And I actually see one of, my, one of my friends that I had played against in high school who was on the Red Sox as well, Sam Travis. Um, he was, I think it was like his second or third year with the Red Sox at that time. Uh, he was also on a rehab assignment. So him and Pedroia were out there hitting and then I was out there hitting with them. Um, and yeah, Pedroia is, I mean, he's a character, like he's just, he's a professional through and through, but uh, a really solid dude. And, um, uh, yeah, it was just, it was, it was surreal to be able to, uh, just kind of be around him for sure. Did you learn anything from that little experience you got with Pedroia? Yeah, uh, I think what I learned is not to take myself too seriously. Um, I think he's one of the, the biggest competitors in baseball and, and takes baseball very seriously. But, um, you know, he understands that um, it's, it's, it, you can't be super serious all the time. Um, he, keeps it, he keeps it light out there. But uh, when it's time to work, it's time to work. Um, and when it's, when it's time to mess around, he'll be the first one to do it. So I think um, finding that fine line is, uh, is really important. Yeah, that that that's awesome. So, yeah, me go a lot of uh, funny memories uh, uh, when you're uh, having fun playing the game you love. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, last season you played in. Uh, you went on to the Carolina League with the uh, Salem Red Sox. So what was it like moving up the depth chart and realizing that you're getting closer and closer to playing with the big club in Boston? Yeah, it was uh, it was fun last year. We uh, again we were not very good. Um, the first half of the season, um, I, I mean, we weren't, we weren't dead last, but we weren't very good. And then, um, we were in, you know, top, top one, first place, second place, pretty much all the second half. And then we ended up clinching and, uh, you know, we were the first place team in the second half. We made it to the playoffs and uh, we ended up losing in, in the, uh, the first round, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good time. It was good for my development to, um, to see kind of like the next level and, um, kind of prove myself there and that's kind of the goal is just continuing moving up and proving yourself at each level until uh, until you get a shot you know that's all you can do yeah so what, what was that like playoff experience like because uh playoff baseball is probably the best season there is so like what do you what do you learn from that uh series and like the series as a whole yeah that was um so that was the second time that I got to uh pop champagne with a team I did an indie ball for the first time and then did it again last year and um it's a really cool experience to do that for sure i mean that's what you play for is um you know to be with, to be with your team really is uh you, know, you do it for the guy next to you and um especially when you get to playoffs it's it's um it's just a different kind of animal everyone's everyone's a little on edge but um everyone wants to win so um it's a lot you know i wish i wish the entire season was like that and I, I sometimes I don't understand why it's not like that, but um, yeah, that's kind of like what you play for is again situations like that, and it's, it's a blast. Yeah, it's anytime you get in the playoffs, it's uh, so much fun, especially when uh, you're winning too. Definitely. 
Yeah, so uh, you played uh, 127 games and went 271 batting average, 345 on base percentage, and 375 slugging percentage last year. So would you say that was your best year of baseball that you had in the pros so far? Um, I would definitely say it's probably my most consistent year that I've had. Um, I, you know, playing that many games, um, you know, I think I had the most games played on my team. Um, and playing shortstop, you know, a primary position, it takes a toll on your body. And, um, you know, thank God I've, I've gone through stuff like that before to, to learn how to recover and uh, deal with that. But um, I think each year I'm getting better and better with the longevity, longevity of the season um, and being consistent through the entire 140 game season. Um, and, not, you know, some, some players will get hot and cold and some, some guys will get, you know, hurt and take a, take a week long break and, uh, you know, come back and feel better. But uh, for me, you know, I think playing every day is um, it's something that I'll, you know, if I'll, I'll play with a broken leg. I don't care. Like, I'm, I'm not going to take myself out of the lineup ever. Um, I want to play every day. I don't care how my body feels or, or any of that. Um, you know, as long as I'm not putting my team in, in a, uh, you know, jeopardizing my team, um, I want to play every day. So that was kind of something I learned from the season was um, how, how to handle that to play every single day. Do you have like personal goals for yourself before like each game or each season? Like what's your like kind of, I guess, like I said, mindset of I, I want to do this for a specific game or a season, or is it just kind of like, I'm going to go out there and play the best I can? Yeah. I don't really have any uh, result based goals. Most of my goals are value based. Um, again, that kind of gets back into the, the whole process first um, versus like results um, my value based goals are, are the same, you know, for my life, really, it's not, uh, anything different from my game to, to life. It's, it's to continue to hammer out my process, um, and improve the process as best I can. Um, and then I actually, I have one result based goal, um, each year and that's to have a 130 WRC plus. So any number above 130 WRC plus, and that stands for weighted runs created. Um, that's pretty much the only statistic that I really care about, um, in terms of offense. Um, and then defense would be, uh, you know, like defensive run save. Um, that's another important one to me, but, uh, yeah, my, my only result based goal going into each year is, is to have a, uh, a WRC plus above 130. <laughs> hey, that, that's a, that's a good goal as well. Yeah. So you uh you pride yourself on your defensive play. So uh, you won you won the Boston Red Sox Minor League Defensive Player of the Year award. So what was it like winning that award at the professional level, and how much did it mean to you? Yeah, it was extremely special to me. Um, I think it was even more special to my parents, uh, who you know sacrificed so much for me to get to where I'm at. And um, you know, I, I tell this story a lot about. Uh, you know, my parents and they, uh, when I didn't get drafted and they watched the, the draft on day three and, you know, the last pick was made and obviously my name wasn't called and, um, you know, they cried, they both cried in my arms and, uh, you know, I almost laughed at them and I was like, guys, look, it's not over. You know, I'm going to continue playing. Like we're going to figure it out. Um, so to go from that to, um, you know, receiving an award at Fenway before the game on the field with my family on the field there was like super cool. And to see him cry again, except, you know, crying you know tears of joy this time but uh, um, that was really the kind of the special moment was to see them experience it um, for themselves that was that was the cool part yeah that's that's super awesome and how, how much does family mean to you because obviously it's a huge part in your life yeah no family is everything to me um, it's really kind of what keeps me uh, grounded um, especially in baseball where there's a lot of failure um, you know, the way that I handle the failure within the game is understanding that, you know, the, my family and, you know, like the five other people that I really, really love and care about are healthy and, and happy. Um, I don't care if I go over four, you know, I, that's fine with me. I don't care if I, I make the, uh, the game ending error. Um, cause I know that I put the work in to, to do my best. Um, it's not like I tried to strike out four times or I tried to make that error. Um, I understand that I stuck to my process. I did what I had to do. Obviously it's not a good feeling when that stuff happens. Um, but I, I try not to beat myself up over it. Um, and just know that, you know, I'm still a good, a good person, a good son, a good brother, a good friend, a good teammate. Um, and that the people that I care about are healthy and happy. And that's, that's really all I need in life. 
Yeah, so we have a few more questions for you before uh, we let you go. So okay. who, is, who is your biggest inspiration? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, probably my grandpa. My grandpa passed away back in 2007. Um, and, like, he's, he's had more of an impact on me, I feel like, um, since he has passed away, kind of just – understanding um what kind of person he was and you know his view of the world and um something that i try to emulate nowadays uh, that i didn't really understand when i was younger um when he was alive um so yeah definitely probably be my grandpa yeah that's awesome so what do you think's the best thing about taking road trips with the team and playing uh roadies <laughs> couple roadies uh yeah so probably my favorite thing um I like, I like when we, we go out to dinner together, um, after the games, um, you know, we'll, they usually serve us our, our post game dinner in the locker room, but those aren't always, um, sufficient enough. So I mean, it's fun to, it's fun to get back to the hotel and then, um, you know, go to the, go to the Texas roadhouse down the street or the Chili's down the street and get some food and just, just kind of shoot the shit with the guys. The, the best time is, uh, when you're, when you're with your teammates and, Make some unreal story, unreal memories there. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, so I I also read that you're uh, since you played hockey, you're a hockey player playing baseball. I've that I've read that you quoted that. So what what's that quote about? Yeah, um, as you know, hockey players are just a different breed. Um, you know, you play hockey, and um, it's it's just a different sport um, in terms of the camaraderie and the intensity that it takes to play the game um you know the physicality i think that's what a lot of people see from the outside is like oh they're so tough because of the physicality but um i think it's more than the mentality um rather than the physicality um to play that game um so for me you know i always just say you would you know happy gilmore says you know i'm a hockey player but i'm playing golf today for me it's you know i'm a hockey player but i'm i'm playing baseball today um so i try to take that mentality of uh uh, you know, like you're in a hockey game, like, Hey, I'm, I'm fighting for the guy next to me. Um, you know, I'm going to try to dig this puck out of the corner and get it to him in front of the net so he can score. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I know, I, you know, if you look at my, my stats, I was always the guy scoring, um, because I had an older brother that was that guy that, you know, wanted to be the, the guy making the assist rather than getting the goal. Um, so I, I kind of try to take that part of, of my game or my brother's game where, you know, I want to make my teammates better, um, on the field as much as I can. Yeah, so that brings up my uh, my uh, next point. I got a little challenge for you. Okay. So once this whole quarantine thing ends, and if you're still around, uh, since you also live in Illinois, well, uh, I'd like to challenge you to a shootout challenge in hockey, or maybe like a game of pig or something. You say. I would, definitely, yeah, I definitely like to do a, a little shootout challenge. Uh, who's playing goalie? Or you want to switch off, or how do you want to do that? We can switch off. Yeah. Switch off. Go go like uh, maybe twenty shots each. Yeah, we'll just, like just go straight penalty shots. Yeah. All right, that sounds good. Yeah, I got uh, I got some rollerblades. I usually don't wear my rollerblades because I play tendy most of the time. But, uh, yeah, I'd love to do that. That'd be fun. Yeah, for sure. So once this whole quarantine ends, I'll definitely hit you up with that. Yeah, we'll have to get that on video, too. That'd be yeah, fun. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Tyler, do you have any uh, final questions before this thing ends? Yeah, I, I got one more. Do you have any like pregame like rituals or habits that you do before any of any of your games? Yeah, I don't do anything quirky. I don't really believe in um, any superstition because because when you believe in that stuff, yeah, I don't believe in superstitions. Just because when you believe in it, you kind of give your power away, and you no longer have the power. The superstition then has the power. So, um, you know, I like having the power in um, deciding my own fate. Um, but yeah, I think the only thing that I do, um, would be, I always, I always put coconut oil in my hair, um, cause Brandon, Brandon, Brandon Crawford does it and his hair is phenomenal. But, uh, the other thing I do is just like a quick little, um, like a yoga breathing type thing with a foam roller, um, put it on like my lower back and I do like a certain little breathing exercise. But other than that, yeah, I, I don't really have any certain routine, <laughs> nothing that's, crazy. That's interesting with the coconut oil, coconut oil, yeah. you got the happy <laughs> flow though. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I keep the hair. Just a little piece of hockey that I take with me everywhere I go. <laughs> yeah, so that's a great way to end this. Uh, so, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we really appreciate it, and I look forward to uh, that challenge. Yeah, definitely. Can't wait. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, no problem.